and this is a live stream please let me know if you can hear me out there all right please let me know if you could hear me out there and i'm in a different location it sort of looks like i'm floating here which is sort of cool i repositioned where i was sitting because uh I've done a couple other like meetings and live streams uh, in the last day and the lighting was terrible. It was all pixely and grainy. So I moved my laptop right in front of the window here. It's very dark behind me. No, no light behind me. And it does look like I'm floating out here. Totally weird. And uh, it looks pretty good now that it's, it's actually raining quite a bit. I'm in the Atlanta area. We got a few things to talk about today. Quentin, my man, Quentin is on. Dude, I need to send you an email. Um, I watched the video you sent me. I'm sorry on the delay. A lot of things have been going on. I actually drove close by your area, my man. I drove from uh, Colorado to Atlanta. Not super close. I actually checked to see. I was like, can I swing by? How close is it? But it was kind of, uh, oh, I'll catch up with you later, man. I appreciate that you're hopping on here. So I see a few questions. Let me know where you're from in the chat and everything. I see we got Kevin. We got KVT. We have some other folks. We got Valen. What's up? And um, we got a few things to cover today. I will let you know today could be a bit of a rambling mess. As I mentioned, I did a, a little bit of driving. So I've been on the road. I've been very distracted, which is fine. It's just one of the luxuries that we have working for yourself. But sometimes things get a little bananas and uh, things get behind because we want to do a lot of things. But sometimes we can't do all the things that we want to do. And we got John out of Silver Thorn. Cool. And Quentin says we'll get beers in the new year. That's cool, man. I think I may have a little time to swing by um, your location. So I will see how it goes. I do have my dog with me and she's a bit temperamental. Um, so I always got to keep that in mind. So, all right, we got a few things that we're doing today. And I do see questions out there. I will get to as many of them as I can. Um, it's a little bit of a different format these days. And that is, I have things that I want to talk about and cover. There are some questions that I can get to. If they're relevant to what we're talking about, then definitely going to be um, included. But if they're just kind of random things, I may or may not get to them. Nothing personal. It's just like what we got to do, what I have to do to keep myself sane and still do live streams. So we do have some cool clips um, that I'm gonna be playing from you know previous guests on the show and just you know folks that are out there, interesting clips. I think some of them may just be me talking, you know, previous videos that I wanna highlight, but we'll get to that when we get to it. First thing I wanna talk about is the meetup in the Atlanta area. So I am from the Atlanta area and I'm here now. So up in the Gwinnett zone. And basically, um, when I got to roughly, I would say like 100 miles out from Atlanta, like traffic was uh, much worse. And I'm not going to rant too much on the traffic because I think that could be boring. Not 100% sure. I think it could be boring. And uh, oh, I think we may have a visitor sneaking in behind me here. Um, so Basically, um, I didn't want to sign myself up for a meetup where I had to drive a really long way and everyone had to drive a long way. So it's actually in Gwinnett. I wanted to maybe have a cool um, like room in a, in a tap room or a brewery or something like that. And then I was sort of looking at areas that were close to the interstate. And um, basically, I didn't see anything super close so we're doing on the border, all right? <laughs> I like Tex-Mex food. They have, uh, you know, a variety of foods for different, uh, you know, people that want different kind of things. And um, they have some cold drinks, some cold beer, and uh, it's on the border, all right? I just, I was like, I don't know where to go. I'm probably giving them a call and make sure we got enough space here. So um, as we are mentioning that, it's on Pleasant Hill, um, information is in the description. If you are going to show up, please email me and let me know so I can get a table or area large enough. So um, basically, basically, we're just going to hang out, talk about affiliate marketing or whatever we want. Um, in fact, someone was like, what are we going to talk about? And I'm like, whatever, whatever we want to talk about, man. We talk about uh, all the food or the weather. It's been raining like 
crazy for the last 12 hours or, or so <laughs> where I'm at. So, uh, yeah, we could do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. Um, we could talk about affiliate marketing or nothing is totally up to us. I will, um, I will talk about myself <laughs> at some point. And, um, actually I have a few points that I'll probably put together and just chat. Everyone's like, Oh, what can I do to grow my site? I have like three main things that I'm going to talk about. Obviously it's not going to be like step by step or anything like that, but I do know, uh, probably a couple, uh, people that I've talked to on YouTube are going to show up. Marty McLeod, a uh, longtime friend of the, of the channel niche Day project and so on. And then I think Evan Porter is going to be able to make it as well. He hasn't confirmed, but I did catch up with him previously. And then there's a handful of other folks um, that have not been on the channel, but hopefully we'll have a few people to chat with. It's kind of nice. I mean, a lot of times we're the only people that we know that understand affiliate marketing. And we could talk about these very deep, specific things that no one else really gets. And you could have those conversations in immediately. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Um, and that's going to be Sunday, December 15th, um, from 1 to 3 p.m. here, Eastern time, all right? And it is uh, Friday the 13th. I didn't even realize it was going to be until I was looking at the date today. So um, thanks, everyone, for saying hello. We got Brandon Fahid from Pakistan. We have Papan. Um, who is making $500 per month with KGR keywords. That's fantastic. Give us a few more details if you can. How many posts do you have on your site? How old is your site? Whatever you want to tell us. Are you doing link building? Kevin, what's up? You're using uh, Kyle, Kyle Roof's tool, Page Optimizer Pro or Pop. And you know that I know Kyle and you know him too. All right. That's great. You're wondering if I've used pop personally and how long it takes us to see results. So I tested with it, um, months ago. I only looked at like one post, so I don't have enough data. However, what I can tell you is I have done similar optimization, not using page optimizer pro. And typically I found results within a week or so. So I made the changes. I also, I typically, when I make those changes right on onsite stuff, I will also do some interlinking as well. Lately, I've been using a tool called Link Whisper, which I'm an affiliate for. There's a link in the description. I earn a commission if you buy. Basically, anything that I mention, I am probably an affiliate for, and I will earn money. Thank you if you use any of those links. So basically, I see results fairly quickly, usually within a week. Um, On-site changes usually happen quite fast. So... I think you don't have to, but I do encourage you to make like some on-site changes, run some internal links. If you have the ability to make, create some external links as well, that is a nice touch. That's a nice touch as well. So um, quick note. Um, so Atlanta Meetup, I'll probably mention it again. People come and they go um, with these live streams and sometimes people miss the very first part. So probably mention it again. I will give you a quick update on the aged site case study where the premise is I bought a site that was aged. It was a brand new site out there. Or sorry, not a brand new site. It was a and it was an aged site, not a brand new site. I bought it from Human Proof Designs. They have uh, many sites available. You could like go check it out, buy a site, save 5% if you use my coupon code below. And you can uh, probably get the site by the end of the weekend. Like they have them ready to go. Don't don't quote me on that, but um, they have the sites ready. You don't have to wait for them to build them. So I'm outsourcing essentially all the activities. And the latest earnings update from November is, uh, I think it was $59.48, which is, I think it was about even from October. So I was hoping to see like a little bit more um, growth as far as the earnings. However, however, um, the traffic is trending up. It's continuing to trend up. And uh, Duke's on. What's up, Duke? You're in and out while doing some other things. But uh, we appreciate that, th that you hopped on. We haven't caught up in a while. I hope things are well. So anyway, the age site case study is uh, going fine. And... $59.48 in November. So things are trending um, just up. Traffic seems fine. And we're we're approaching, I, I think the date that I 
installed analytics on the site was June the 16th. So Monday will be the six month anniversary. And I am actually curious if there was some sort of a, like a mini, I'm just speculating here, but if there was like a mini little sandbox out there for a site that is aged yet, maybe nothing was done for quite some time. So it could be, it could be maybe things are going to grow a little faster. But the other confusing part is we are in the retail season right now. So that means there's probably a little more traffic, a little more sales. Sales are doing pretty good this month. You know, we're in just just about halfway. Um, and I think some people are doing some uh, holiday shopping. So maybe they just bought uh, one or two items from, uh, I guess, that were related to the products on the site and then they bought a whole bunch of other stuff too so earnings are tracking um, pretty well um, for December so one other thing that I'll, I'll mention since uh, the good folks here on the on the live stream and the people that watch the recording you're important too but you'll get a scoop too so the people that actually watch these videos I'm thinking about bringing some of the link building activities in house because as I look at the budget which I'm still you know right along the area that I thought it would be which is about oh gosh I can't remember we'll just say 14,000 in the first six months something like that we're we're in the area that we expected all right I I was patient and I I waited for you know various sales or deals from the Hoth specifically been really happy with the guest posting um, from them However, any of these services that you use are going to be way more expensive than you could do it yourself. Yes, there's trade-offs for doing the work yourself versus outsourcing it and is generally cost and uh, time, right? Those are the, the two main resources we're dealing with here. And as I was as I was like looking at some of the other guest posting and links that I'm getting in-house with a VA of mine, I um, realized that maybe I should change the rules because I made them up. I could change the rules for the age site case study and say, okay, now we're going to be building links my way. And it's going to be somewhere um, like five to eight times cheaper, something like that. I mean, it's just so expensive to use a service. And that is, you know, a lot of people are saying that, but the other part is people are like, I want to outsource it and I want it to be high quality and I want it to be cheap. And there's just no combination of that. So as I'm looking at the numbers and I'm like, all right, what, what do I want out of this case study? Um, you know, if you can afford to buy the links and you don't have much time, buy the links of via a service like the Hoth. If you have more time, maybe you have a VA, maybe you want to learn how to, you know, obtain these guest posts, then perhaps you, you pull it in house, you do... Um, you know, some guest posting, you do some outreach, you do promotion, right? You promote your site. So I may, I may switch it around and it'll give me more things to talk about. You know, <laughs> that's like, um, that's the key. You know, I could just, I could, if things are going well, I could talk about that. If they shit the bed, I talk about that too. So um, anyway, age site case study, things are going sort of how I expect slow growth, nothing alarming. And um, you know, I think, you know, over time, it's going to be more and more profitable. So um, quick note on the Doug Show podcast. I hope everyone out there is a listener. Highly encourage you to subscribe using a like a, a podcasting directory or an app. Um, I do, I, I release the shows on YouTube, but it's something like six months behind. So I know people do check it out. Some people are only YouTube, but I, I literally release the episodes much, much later. I sort of bank them up so I'd be able to publish on YouTube on a long, long-term basis without doing anything else. So they're just banked up. I probably have, I don't know, there's probably like 50 episodes out there. I'm not sure how far ahead we are, but we hit episode 100 on the Doug show, which is super cool. People are listening getting great feedback from folks to email or send voicemails and stuff. But if you only check it out on YouTube, highly encourage you to check it out on a podcast directory. And I think it gives you a little bit more focus, all right? I'll be honest with you. On YouTube, there are just too many distractions. I love YouTube. I watch it um, when I'm working out a lot of times um, or just to burn time, you know, when I'm just trying to waste time. 
just get out of my head a little bit. I'll watch uh, like stand up comedy, other stuff like that. Sometimes like, uh, you know, finance, uh, like financial independence kind of stuff, investing, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, basically check out, uh, check out the podcast on a podcast player because on YouTube, you're quite distracted where they literally try to like get you to watch more and more stuff and just keep you on the platform longer on a podcast. You, you probably are going to listen to the full episode. Sometimes the important stuff, the nuggets are at the end. So cool. Let's, um, I got a couple clips that I'm going to play and I need, I do need to mention them. So let me see what we have coming up here. So this is one of the like more popular interviews that I've done. This is from Ellen. And I know a lot of people have seen some of the, actually the full interview from Ellen. She's a former social worker. She had some previous success, I think with a travel type blog um, years ago. And then she got into the keyword golden ratio. She started publishing a lot of content on her site and her and her husband developed a, like an ROI calculator for the keyword golden ratio it seems to check out at least at the time that we recorded the interview, which is some time ago, it was enough data that she was able to, I guess, tease out from her experience where like the ROI held up. Now, I think the ROI for affiliate sites and niche sites in general, whether it's an affiliate site or a display ad based site, I think the ROI calculation is a little bit funny because over time, you're just going to keep making money most likely. So the ROI is going to creep up over time if things are trending in the right direction. But anyway, here is her explanation of like the ROI method for the keyword golden ratio. So if anyone has experience with it or if you investigated it further, I'd be interested to hear about it. This is the formula that has worked for me and proven true for me. Results may not necessarily be applicable to and transferable to everyone, but I had heard, I think on income school or you, that the idea of you could earn $1 per month for every view you got in one day. So for example, if you're getting 1800 views a day consistently, then you would theoretically be making $1,800 a month. And so I latched onto that, like, you know, oh, this can't be that hard. Like, surely if I just do that, you know, I'll be able to, to get to that point. And so I wanted to see what that would look like, you know, for my particular niche and regarding the KGR specifically. So I'll have to refer to my notes a little bit on this one, but I do pay for some of my content. I've probably written half of it and paid for the other half. And so this... ROI calculation is based on paying a $20 for an article. Um, so sometimes I'll, I'll pay more than that, but this is just kind of general um, $20 an article. So if you pay $20 an article right now with my current traffic, I'm getting 2.5 visits per day per KGR article. So I took out all those other articles that I'd published before and this, these calculations don't include that. So about two and a half visits a day per KGR article. On average, I'm earning about $1.50 for each of those views. So it comes out to one article times two and a half views a day times 1.5 um, views. And that gives you total for how much you can expect that article to earn for you. So an example of this would be, to put it in practical terms, let's say I order 100 KGR articles at $20 a piece for a total of $2,000. So I'm looking at how quickly am I going to make a return on that investment? Is that really going to pay off? And if so, how quickly is that going to happen? So I've paid $2,000 for these articles. And just for the sake of this, let's forget the Google sandbox. Let's assume they start getting traffic like right away. Um, your site's not new or yeah, your site's not new. Mm -hmm. They're going to start ranking immediately. So each post is receiving two and a half views a day, earning an average of $1.50 each. That's going to give me on those 100 posts, $250 per month, just for that batch of 100. 
So I spent $2,000 total. So after six months, I would have earned $1,500 off of those articles. So at six months, I haven't quite made back my initial investment, but I'm getting close. And then after 12 months, I will have earned, assuming no growth, Mm -hmm. static results, they'll earn $3,000 total for the the 12 month period. Mm -hmm. So I spend 2,000, end up with your 2,000 back plus a a thousand more. So I get a 50% return on my investment. I've recouped my cost in four to six months Mm -hmm. and then ended the year with like a 200% return on my investment. It just kind of depends on how each article performs, but that's just kind of an average. I'm going for the goal of within six months, I want to make back my money and within the next six months, so within 12 months, I want to double my money. And so as an investor in the stock market, that's pretty impressive to me that like in one year, I could double my money. Right. You know, it makes me a couple years to double my money in a good economy. You know, I I might not get to that point for like five years or something. And so that's actually really impressive because I think people probably are like, oh, I don't want to spend money on content if I don't know it's going to work. My suggestion would be spend a little money on content or a lot of time writing it and prove it. I think the example you use is 10 posts, you know, maybe do 35 or something Mm -hmm. like that. Something a little bigger because, you know, not all of the KJR terms will end up ranking. Most probably will, but they, it's not guaranteed. So, you know, experiment with it with kind of a smaller batch. And then once you earn money off of that batch, my recommendation at least would be don't be afraid to pour that money back into scaling your business Mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, paying for content or writing content yourself. But yeah, so from an investment perspective, I actually think it's really very interesting because I'm sure that holds a lot of people back is this, you feel like you're spending money by paying for content, but in reality, after a year, you know, that, that may allow you to earn. And if, you know, if Amazon Associates program stays around and Google doesn't penalize you, you're just going to mm-hmm. keep accelerating that growth. And so it's going to pay off so much more down the long, uh, you know, in the long run. So cool. All right. And that was Ellen. And if you didn't see her full interview, it is from a while back, but I mean, everything holds true. But if you just search my channel for Ellen, um, you should find her video, the full interview out there. And I believe Kevin asked like, hey, are we ever going to see an update from Ellen? The answer is no, you won't. So I checked with her, uh, checked in with her a couple of times in the past just to see what's going on. And she was like, hey, I just want to opt out, kind of want to remain private, fly under the radar, which is smart. I totally respect that. And, she, and you know, things are going well. Um, so the other thing I'll mention is uh, I talked about, uh, Papan, uh, mentioned that he hit $500 a month with KGR words, KGR keywords. And I was like, Hey, well, give us a few more details if you can. So he has 30 KGR posts that are related to buying content. So that means like basically someone is interested in buying something in the near term. They're probably researching a specific product. And he mentions that 10 posts are ranking in the top 10 already. And there are no backlinks. So it's just KGR and it seems to be working. I know some people ask um, actually just about every day um, like, hey, income school says that the keyword golden ratio doesn't work. And that is that is OK. They ask me why they say that. Now, I don't know. I can't answer for them. But if you want to ask them, you can. If you want to ask other people about, you know, have they had good experiences with, with the keyword golden ratio, I encourage you to check it out. Um, I don't need to convince you anymore. I don't need to convince people anymore. Other people are doing it for me. So it's kind of a nice position. The other very key thing is I don't sell anything associated with the KGR. I make no money directly from you believing that the KGR is a thing. There are other services out there, right, that maybe you can hire them to do KGR services to like find keywords for you. Other people are trying to create tools and other things, but um, you know, I, I could have done that. I could have said, hey, there's this concept, by the way, you need to buy my tool and um, I can make money from that. But I opted out. I very clearly opted out from that. There's a couple cool reasons, right? Because then I can separate myself. I don't have a specific clear incentive to sell you anything, right? Um, By you believing that the KGR is real, 
I'm just sharing the information and it's helping people. It's helping a lot of people, a lot of people right here in this uh, that are watching live here. So anyway, most people that don't think the KGR works, right? So if they don't believe it, they usually just haven't tried it yet. Typically, if someone tries it, they give it a good shot, they're going to be okay. And they're going to be like, hey, you know, I can't do everything with a KGR, but it is kind of a nice tool, especially, I, I mean, I know people were building sites. They were putting a lot of time into it and they were like, oh, if I just build it, they will come. That is not a thing. That's from a movie, right? It's just from a movie, not a thing. It doesn't work on the internet. People don't care about your website. They don't care about you. They don't care about your content. They have a problem that they want solved and they really don't care who solves it. So if you build a site and you don't do anything, they're probably not going to just come anyway the point is um, they would they would build a site they didn't really have much direction and um, they were spending a ton of time on it and they didn't they weren't ranking at all the keyword golden ratio does allow you to do it so anyway a lot of uh, Dennis says KGR rocks and um, yeah other just find the success stories out there all right I, I just got into a rant there started contradicting myself that happens that happens when you just start talking so another clip I got going on here is just about affiliate sites not being for everyone. So this is my friend over at Fat Stacks blog. His name is John Dykstra. He's been on the channel a few times. Very smart guy. Um, he's also bald. You know, he has that going on as well. We save a lot of time by not having to care for... <laughs> our hair. We don't have to dry our hair. I don't use shampoo or conditioner. Don't need it. I don't need it at all. So John, John makes most of his money from his display ad sites, not affiliate marketing. So I think it's important to note, there's many ways to work online. I'm just telling you about my experience, a few ideas that may be helpful for you, but let's hear it from John. For the first half, I would say, of being online here, I did all affiliate stuff uh, because I read constantly affiliates, you know, that's where the money is. And, you know, ads are a waste of money. It's pennies versus dollars. And, and I bought into it. And uh, I don't know, I started up a niche site at one point and doing the affiliate thing, hammering away and was going nowhere. And I thought, I did have an AdSense account. This is way back when AdSense was fairly easy to get. Um, so I just had one languishing and, and I decided, oh, I'll throw a few ads on there and just see what happens. And it was like, it, it, I mean, for relative to what the affiliate stuff was doing, it was amazing. And, and that was like right away, I just saw the potential of, of what ads could do for a site with traffic. So I completely shifted and uh, I still do a fair amount of affiliate, but the, the display ads have definitely uh, exceeded the affiliate stuff. And so, yeah, I I shifted focus and now pretty much every site I, I run except for FastStacks is, is ad supported. And uh, I, I like it and I like it primarily because I love the flexibility, uh, coming back to flexibility again. I like flexibility in my life, but I like it for publishing too, because with affiliate stuff, if you want to make money with affiliate links, you have to publish a certain type of content, which we call buyer intent. And there needs to be an intent behind it uh, where somebody's going to look, click, and potentially buy. If you put a bunch of affiliate links on just some general informational stuff, your chance of generating any and clicks and, and sales are very low. So, uh, but with that, it's, you can write on any topic you like. And I, I really like that. I like to be able to publish on just some random informational article that I find interesting or topic uh, that's related to the niche and I could still monetize that. And that was really freeing. So that's that's that was a huge point. And I was able to really go after a lot of topics with almost no competition. Uh, or very little competition and focus on publishing content and know that that content would be monetized. And I'm not saying this each piece of content makes a fortune from ads, it doesn't, but it's in the aggregate. I'm able to publish more content, I'm able to go after more traffic, and so it's a, it's a higher traffic volume uh, model, but it, it's for me it's worked out very nicely. Yes. and. I'll put links and stuff, but you do publish some income reports and just say for about uh, like the last several months, like what's the average profit 
from your portfolio of sites that you publish income reports on? Right, it, it ranges from right now it ranges about I would say thirty to forty five thousand US a month. Um, my expenses fluctuate a little bit, and uh, obviously revenue fluctuates. Um, but yeah, that, that's the range we're talking about right now. Okay, excellent. I just want to give everyone like the scope of what we're talking about. So most people would say that serious money um, beyond like you know full time what most people are are making like in general. So that's awesome. Congratulations, John. Thanks. That's really good. All right. That was John Dykstra. And if you want to check out some of his recent income reports, there is a link in the description. And as I mentioned before, I'm an affiliate for uh, any of the products or things that I'm mentioning most likely. So I could earn a commission if you buy anything. But John just has like good information on his site. Highly encourage you to check out his newsletter. I don't sign up to many of them, but um, his emails are pretty good. His emails are pretty good. Usually they're entertaining uh, just in general. And yeah, we're both bald. I see Dennis mentioned that you're bald and, and proud of it. That That's fantastic, man. I, I highly encourage people to check it out. You know, if you're just kind of going bald a little bit, it's not a great look, you know, not, not super awesome. I mean, I was in that limbo. We, you know, many folks are, you're just stuck in that limbo for a little while. And uh, I just kept cutting it shorter and shorter until I, you know, had, like clippers and I was cutting it down. But uh, honestly, I was cutting my own hair um, for actually since I'm like 15, since I was 15 or so. And um, I just, I had a simple haircut anyway. So I was like cutting it myself and then I just kept cutting it shorter and shorter and shorter. And um, basically, <laughs> Basically, if you are, if, if you make a decision, whether, whether it's like being bald or something else, it's usually better just to like make a decision, like do something versus like just letting things happen to you, like thinning hair <laughs> and that sort of thing. So make a decision, just shave it. It's great. It's great. Look, look at that. It's a good shape head, you know, and it, even if your head isn't shaped uh, quite right, you know, don't be afraid. You probably don't have to look at it that much. It's other people <laughs> that have to deal with it. So um, anyway, John's great. He's bald. He can grow a beard. I can't really grow a beard that well. Um, I've tried a little bit and it on camera, like it kind of maybe looks okay, but in person, it just looks weird. It's not thick enough. It's just not thick enough. So n no one asked that question, but sometimes on these live streams, I just start talking just start talking about things. So I see um, Dr. Suffis Parenting is, uh, all right, I, I love these. Well, let's humor, let's humor this. All right, um, I have a serious question about the KGR. All right, we're listening, very serious. Can anyone ask? Okay, I hope that's not your question. I don't think it is, but um, I have been accused in the past of just being literal and um, yeah, that's 100% true. Usually I'm literal, then maybe I try and help you a little bit. Okay, so number one, you say, I publish 10 KGR articles related to stroller and baby car seat. Number one, don't say your niche. Now, you know, people know. They can go find it, you know. Um, none of them rank until the 15th page of Google. Okay, so there's a couple, couple things to look out for. I'll just mention them really quickly. Fine question, all right? Fine question. Basically, make sure you're not keyword stuffing. Make sure the content is good. Make sure the grammar is tight, not misspelled words. I can't tell you how many people, they're like, Doug, um, I publish content. The content is fantastic. I hired a writer um, and they're doing a great job. And then I read the content and it's just horseshit. It's terrible. It's just terrible. The first two sent. I only often I only have to read like three sentences, and I'm like, this is awful. There's misspelled words. It doesn't make sense. If I was actually looking for a stroller or a car seat, I would read the first sentence and think, this person clearly doesn't know what they're talking about. How how is this even on the internet? And then I would go to some other site. So make sure the content's good. So don't keyword stuff. Make sure the content is good. Um, the other part is you didn't mention how long ago you published the content. It can happen really quick, but if you just launched your site, you just published the content, 
it may take a few days for things to uh, soak in and age for a few weeks or something like that. The other thing that sometimes happen a little less likely, but if you kind of do a bad job on the keyword research and you're like finding keywords that are maybe someone is generally looking for an e-commerce site, right? They're not looking to do research. They want to like buy something right away. Um, sometimes those keywords show up. Maybe it's a keyword where you have, um, you know, all YouTube videos, for example. I don't think that's probably the case here. And you mentioned one month. Okay. My, my, my uh, guess is there is probably one of those couple mistakes that I mentioned. And then the other thing is, um, I think there were a couple public case studies in the stroller and baby car seat area. And a lot of times it is kind of better to not like try to emulate a public case study out there because there are a ton of copycats, thus more competition and so on and so forth. So check those couple things, make sure your content is good, make sure that um, you're not keyword stuffing. So if you're using a tool like Yoast SEO, then you potentially could be very misled. In fact, that is a very, that is a perfect segue. Kyle Roof, one of my friends out there in the SEO world, he is uh, talking about, or in this clip that I'm about to play, he, he will be talking about keyword clusters and he actually mentions Yoast SEO, the plugin, the very popular plugin, which I stopped using. I'll come back to that maybe someday, but here, let me play this clip from Kyle. If I can speak to Yoast for a second, uh, I don't know how many times somebody has said, well, I've got green dots. You know, I've got the green dots. My SEO is done, but I'm not ranking. You know? <laughs> well, there, there you go. Now, the thing about Yoast, which is it's, it has so many awesome features and it's a, it's a very powerful tool, but to what you said, that it's giving you generalized advice. And we all know that um, what you need to do changes keyword to keyword. And, and it can't give that keyword specific advice. So uh, until they get to that point, you, it's, it's a nice general rule of thumb or a heuristic to use, but it's not the kind of thing that I think is going to drive you. Uh, it, it's not going to get you all the juice that you can get out of just your on-page, you know, just by following that generalized advice. Um, but to mistakes, one thing that we made in our agency, was, and, uh, and everybody does this, is that we were giving ranking reports on specific keywords. And this kind of ties into what you're talking about, your advanced uh, keyword research. You, what you begin to realize is a single page will rank for hundreds or thousands of keywords. A, a successful page is ranked for thousands, but you don't have those thousands of keywords on there. How does that happen? And it happens because you properly optimize for a primary keyword. So something that you want to think about is when you're deciding on, okay, I want this keyword, you should also look at what we, what we call the cluster, those secondary keywords that you can win by properly optimizing for that top-level phrase. Because what happens is that sometimes you look at the cluster and you can get the uh, good feel for those from Google Trends and related searches. So if you put in your keyword, you can scroll to the bottom and look at the, the related searches. And those are terms that you can win by properly optimizing for that primary keyword. Sometimes they go and uh, they, they take a left turn. You know, like, so this is my phrase, but this cluster really isn't what I want. So if you win that, you're going to get a lot of traffic from those and it might not be the traffic that's going to convert. One other thing to think about is sometimes you might not win that primary but you can win the secondary. So if you ran the secondaries through um, the whatever tools you like to use for difficulty and, and volume and, and stuff like that, what you need to do, you might realize that this is a really easy cluster to win. So if I optimize for that primary, I can win these and I can get my traffic out of those. And it's not, and I don't have to build out an individual page for each one of those things because they're a secondary to that primary. So missing that concept, I think, is, is, is a big mistake. Uh, so when you're doing that advanced keyword research, make sure to look at the cluster and then uh, you can make decisions, uh, much more broad decisions on like, okay, we like this keyword, but we're going to get that whole cluster. But then giving that keyword report, you know, you're only going to get that keyword report or that ranking board on that primary, but that's not telling you what the cluster is doing. You know, so like, like you know, the client freaks out because you wrote number four and now you're number five. Well, so what? Like, what did the cluster do? Maybe the cluster all went up. So the next thing on that is once you get that concept on keyword research, then I think if you go to um, page level performance. So this is the page that we optimize for this primary keyword. How is that page performing? Did its impressions go up? Did its cumulative rank go up or down? And actually, cumulative rank going down is a good thing because that often means you're picking up more queries. A healthy page is growing in its queries. You can see that within Search Console. So something you want to benchmark when you start optimizing an existing page, how many keywords is it, is it currently ranking for in Search Console? And it might be 100. And then you start to do some work, and you'll see actually the average – cumulative rank go down for that page, but you picked up 400 keywords. So you have a page that's exploding. 
you know, your impressions are going up, your clicks presumably are going up. So if you look at page level performance with a mind towards that cluster, and then you benchmark that. So then when the client can see like, hey, we really didn't have a great month. Well, let's look at where we came from. You know, and you can see that we've actually increased this page a thousandfold because we're looking at this entire page and, and all the keywords that we're winning. Um, those are mistakes that many people make as well. They don't benchmark their original thing or they benchmark just on the keyword rank of that primary keyword and they're missing the entire page performance. Interesting. Yeah. I I didn't even think of that, but I have a couple um, pages that I've recently optimized, um, all on page, by the way. And literally exactly what you said, like I saw, um, like on Ahrefs or some rush or whatever tool, um, I happen to be looking at, yeah, tons more keywords that it's ranking for. Of course, search console gives you that data too, but like, and then, uh, you know, maybe the traffic is just barely moving up, but I imagine over time, especially with continued optimization, maybe some links, maybe some smarter internal links, um, like those could continue to move up. So exactly. And you might even see your click through rate go down. How's our click-through rate possible? It's because you're getting more impressions. You're getting more impressions, and they're a little bit deeper. So you know the CTR on page three probably isn't that great, but now you're actually kind of picking up some of those impressions because you're now ranking for more keywords. This this is a healthy page. Healthy pages, their their cumulative rank often goes down before it goes up. Their click-through rate goes down before it goes up because then as the cluster starts to rank higher, but that can take a lot longer to see in the aggregate and in the short term. Those numbers look like they're going in the wrong direction, but really it's a healthy page because you're picking up more queries. All right, and that was Kyle Roof out there. He's over at uh, Page Optimizer Pro, so check it out. I know um, a few people were asking about that. And if you didn't catch the whole interview with him, he is a very, very smart guy. Um, he used to do um, lawyering. He's a lawyer, so super smart guy. He does like pure, like scientific SEO testing. Has an agency, very awesome tool page optimizer pro so so check it out do check out the full interview with him again i didn't put links in the description but if you really want to check out the interview with him then you can just go to my channel search for kyle roof and you'll find the full interview one of the most popular out there in fact sean says more guests like kyle so um actually i need to catch back up with kyle he was like yeah i'm down to uh come and talk shop whenever you want um yeah, just, he's just a smart dude, super nice, really down to earth. I chatted with some people who were able to meet him over in the uh, Chiang Mai SEO conference, which which is cool. So for the people that are just hopping on, I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack just a, a, for a second here because I'm in the Atlanta area. I'm in this different location. It looks like I'm floating here. I'm wearing a black pullover too, so that also <laughs> makes it look a little funny. Um, I had just a, I have a normal shirt on where you could see me and it wouldn't just be a floating head here, but this is cool too. This is pretty cool. So I'm in the Atlanta area. There's going to be meetup on Sunday, the 15th of December, one to three on the border, just a chain restaurant. I was going to do something cool, but um, instead we're just going to a chain because it's a little more convenient and I didn't know where else to go. And, uh, oh, Derek, Derek is in the area. Derek, I hope you can make it, man. Um, Sunday, shoot me an email. Let me know. I'm going to reserve a table or a room or I'm going to call and see whatever I can work out there. And um, yeah, so basically there's a meetup in Atlanta. Um, so I'm trying to arrange it so convenient for my schedule, of course. But also there's like a ton of holiday parties and other gatherings going on. So I try to make it the middle of the day on Sunday. Hopefully people can drop in, hang out for a little while, and talk shop. So a few people were, a um, couple questions came through here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit them, and let's see here. So I, I mentioned that Yoast potentially is throwing people off, and it causes you to do keyword stuffing. And uh, Dr. Suffis says, well, if we don't use the exact match keyword, it gives you an error. So that just tells me what's happening, but that you haven't mentioned what problem you're trying to solve. And my, my point is, and Kyle's point in that part of that clip was, Yoast is giving us a general guideline for like general keyword research and it works for most people writing content. We're not general people 
writing like content, we're doing something very specific with the keyword golden ratio. So doctor, you mentioned that you are trying to use the tool, but what problem are you trying to solve? If you're trying to get the green lights, then you're trying to do something else. You're trying to make the tool happy, not the user. And it's not helpful. Basically, you're, you didn't mention um, like, Hey, I'm trying to like rank higher. Like I want, I want, I want to use the keyword, the proper amount. And basically I'm saying, and what Kyle was saying is if you're following the Yoast guidelines for the keyword, um, density, depending on the details of your keyword, you could be using it too much. So you have to think about what problem you're trying to solve. For me, when I was using Yoast, I wanted to use some of the more advanced tools like, uh, no arc or uh, sorry, no index my archive pages. Um, maybe edit my HT access file. Turns out there are other ways to do that. One of them, like for the no index, you can code it with PHP. So I just like Googled how to no index um, with PHP and blah, blah, blah. So I inserted that code, tested it, it worked. And then I took Yoast off because I also know how to edit my HD access file like five different ways. So it didn't matter. I didn't need to use that um, functionality um, as far as the meta description, the title and all that other stuff. Um, a lot of themes let you put that information in. So I know uh, someone mentioned that uh, Dennis mentioned that you can... Uh, you know what I lost it. There's other tools out there. All right. Basically there's other SEO tools that you can use, but you need to know what you're trying to do. So if you just arbitrary, arbitrarily put in a plugin because people are like, well, be sure you put in this plugin, but you don't know why, then uh, you should question it and maybe figure out why you need it. And if you figure out you don't need it, then just delete it. Okay. Um, Justin's been crushing it out there and it sounds like we'll need to catch up later. You got a little one on the way. Congratulations, man. I'm glad to hear um, things are successful for you. And a quick note, Justin's a student of Five Figure Niche Site. That's my premium course out there. Uh, a lot of times it's not open for enrollment, but if you want to check it out, number one, you should sign up for my email list. I can't believe it's been 47 minutes in here and I haven't mentioned it, but if you're not on my email list, you should sign up. I think a lot of people probably are signed up, but if you just go to nichesiteproject.com, click the green button, enter your name and email, then I'll send you helpful templates. I'll basically, you know, show you the process. I point you in the right direction for different blog content, different videos that could be helpful for you. So um, good list of folks. So Sean mentioned other smart people like Kyle. Um, Richard says, uh, like Miles. So Miles Beckler, really awesome guy as well. And people are looking for more content on advanced SEO. It's hard to find. And basically, all right, so that's the thing. So it's a very, it's, it's very deep. And a lot of people don't know what we're talking about when we go really deep into advanced SEO. Someone mentioned uh, Matt Diggity, who, um, oh, Justin did, who I have talked to um, in the past. He's actually on the channel. I chatted with him and someone else, but it's been a couple years. Oh, Lance, what's going on? And basically, I, um, I, I think some of the topics are very interesting However, it's such a narrow group of people, which doesn't mean I'm not interested because I, I like the technical SEO too, but I, I try to, you know, I try to, <laughs> I try to be more general often, um, knowing that we'll lose people. And I know people like Nathan and Matt and Kyle and myself, we can talk generally. And then if we need to, you know, when we want to, just go deep, nerd out. We'll go really deep into some of those topics. So, all right, couple more questions here. Um, Mohammed asks about what's a good word count for a KGR article. So, it's a tough one. Um, number one, you should always Google. Um, I have a lot of other content out there on like frequently asked questions. nichesideproject.com slash FAQ. So check that out, slash FAQ, a lot of questions there. And um, you could read deeper on some of the things that I'll mention. But just as a 
generalized answer. If you can aim for about a thousand words, that's pretty good. Now, I'll caution you. You don't want to write a thousand words on a something that's simple. So you should always make it as long as it needs to be. A thousand words is pretty good. If it's like sort of a more complex topic, then it can be 3,000 or 4,000 words. If it's like a buying guide and you have many products you're going to mention, then longer can be fine. If it is a simple question, make it a simple answer. You can elaborate a little further, but you don't have to go crazy. So just if you're if you're like, hey, I'm doing KGR articles, how long should it be? 1,000, 1,300 words, something like that is going to be pretty good. And um, Derek mentions that you try not to use too many plugins because it slows down the page load time. I agree 100%. And Derek, you may have missed it earlier. I'm doing a meetup in the um, Gwinnett area, so off Pleasant Hill. Check the, the description. I'm not sure if you're on my email list anymore and stuff like that, but it'd be cool to have you hop in. Um, sounds like a handful of people are going to be able to show up. And I've only done one other meetup. And in that case, um, about half the people dropped out. Um, like they, they just didn't show up. They were like, hey, it should be able to make it or I am going to make it or I will see you there, that sort of thing. So I'm expecting, you know, a handful of folks. Um, I know that uh, Marty, probably Evan are going to show up. I haven't got a confirmation from Evan, but I haven't caught up with him um, in the last couple of days here. So anyway, hopefully people can make it and we'll talk about affiliate marketing and different stuff like that. So let's see any other, any other questions uh, that I missed? I know I missed a bunch of them. And um, another thing with, I guess, just sort of running a business on your own and testing things out is success and failures. I think, um, I think, all of us that have persevered and were successful, or at least like, you know, things aren't completely a train wreck. Cause I, I don't know if you ever feel like, all right, I'm successful. I could point to certain things where I'm like, all right, that thing is successful for right now. Um, but it always comes with failures and uh, complete screw ups. Cause we try things, right? Go look at some of my early YouTube videos, total train wreck total train wreck. I was nervous. I didn't know what to say. Um, I I probably looked like I was scared of the camera and stuff like that. And uh, I was, (laughs) I was totally scared of the camera, but there's success and failures and you just got to get out there and like do things. You got to try things out and uh, see how it goes. You'll learn along the way. And that's all, that's all part of it. And actually um, I'm going to play a clip from uh, Spencer Hawes here where he talks about success and failures. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to tell you about a couple audiobooks that I listened to on my long drive of about 1500 miles from Colorado to Georgia. But here's Spencer. Check it out. With the successes comes the, the failures um, as well. So I, I blogged um, <clears throat> publicly about a few of these. You know, I, I quit my job. I was making over $10,000 a month from my AdSense uh, websites, things were going along great. And then Panda and Penguin came along, you know, 2012, like a year after I quit my job. And those were devastating, not to just other people, but to my sites as well. Um, so a lot of my sites overnight, traffic was cut in half or worse. And uh, so that, yeah, I, I went through that. And if people aren't familiar with Panda and Penguin, they were Google algorithm updates that, that decimated a lot of sites, um, including a lot of mine. And so I, I wrote about those and, and that, so that goes way back, but I, um, not only that, but I had my Google AdSense account shut down, uh, at some point, I don't remember, you know, the years, uh, it's getting a little hazy now, but you know, 2013, I don't remember. Uh, but that uh, to, to, you know, I had, um, I want to say like close to $10,000 ready to be paid out to me and the account shut down. And when you go to log in, it doesn't give you any reason. It just, it's like two sentences that says this Google AdSense account is shut down. And that's like it. Um, you don't get paid out. You, uh, have no recourse. There's nobody to contact at Google AdSense. 
Um, so all of this happened to me. So I've had lots of de devastating things um, happen to me. Uh, just sort of a follow up uh, to the story recently, um, you may have heard about the um, the lawsuit, the class action lawsuit against Google AdSense uh, because of that very specific reason that I just mentioned. They closed lots of accounts and gave no recourse. Um, there was a class action lawsuit that just uh, finished this year um, against Google. And so I did get a small Google AdSense check or a class action lawsuit check uh, for that. I mean, it was peanuts compared to what I should have actually got paid out. It was, I don't remember, a few hundred dollars. So I got that this year, which is kind of funny, like six years later, you know, Google doesn't say they're sorry, but I, you know, I get a couple hundred bucks. So. All right. That was Spencer Haas from Niche Pursuits. And he was like one of the like big inspirations when I got started. He was doing the uh, first niche site project case study, which he, he was like, yeah, man, you could use the name. I checked with him beforehand. And I've been running with it since then, which is uh, cool. I, I mean, I do the project management thing, so it kind of makes sense. Kind of. I don't know. Anyway, Spencer's awesome. He's a creator over at... Uh, or for the the new plugin uh, Link Whisper, which I've been using extensively, very good tool. They're making advancements, um, very popular tool as well. It's sort of taken off, solving a problem for interlinking makes it a little bit easier to do it. So, as I mentioned before, I'm going to mention or <laughs> we, we got to let's clean up our while we're talking here. So, I will mention a couple of the audio books that I listened to while I was driving. So, if um, people are not aware you probably can um, install an app on your phone from your local public library, which is, um, you know, you're paying taxes for it anyway. I don't know where you're, you know, everyone's located, but typically in the US, Canada, you got a public library. Um, there's a couple apps that you can use. One is called Overdrive. One is called Libby, which is a newer one. And um, yeah, you can just download audiobooks or eBooks to your phone or to your Kindle. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily free, but you don't have to pay for it then. You're paying taxes, right? You're obviously paying taxes to your, you know, local community. They have a public library. Anyway, I really enjoy um, like stand-up comedy and comedy and sketch comedy and all that kind of stuff. And I like those people. Usually they're very interesting. So I listened to two books by um, SNL folks. So one is Amy Poehler. It's called Yes, Please. And then the other one is uh, by David Spade. And it's called Almost Interesting. And Amy Poehler's book is, you know, she has a background in sketch comedy. So she worked on like the Upright Citizens Brigade and... Um, I, that was sort of mainly where she spent her time and then she made it over to SNL and then she was on um, Parks and Rec. So I enjoy, I enjoyed Parks and Rec quite a bit. I, I started watching it like after, you know, a few seasons um, and I liked her on SNL. So very, very funny woman. And uh, David Spade, he was in, uh, you know, SNL, of course, but he was in Tommy Boy, Black Sheep and like a bunch of other sitcoms sort of as a uh, supporting actor. And super interesting to listen to both of those, um, but you know, both of them more about SNL. So you get to hear some of the, the background of what it's like to work in that atmosphere, which is insane. And I, I'm not going to spoil anything by mentioning, but um, they have like the host show up on like Monday, all the writers and, and the, all the cast, they meet with the the host. So that could be someone like Alec Baldwin or some other star or whoever, right? Could be the president of the United States, for example. So basically, um, <laughs> so basically they have a meeting, they, they meet, they pitch some ideas, and then they write the sketches on, I believe it's like Monday, Tuesday, and like Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, they kind of select what's going to be on the show and they're going through like 30 or 40 sketch ideas so everyone's there they do a read through and then the the bosses figure out what show or what sketches they want to be on the show and then from like wednesday night at 10 p.m 70 72 hours from showtime they are like building the set they are 
editing the scripts, like punching it up, adding more jokes, making it funnier, revising and editing and iterating. And then they do um, a dress rehearsal and then they do the show live. It's insane like how much work they do. And they they have to do it within 72 hours. So the, the lineup is not finalized until 72 hours before they go live. Totally, totally insane. So anyway, super interesting to listen to common thread right so this is related to what we're talking about so it's not completely out of left field number one on a long drive i enjoy it number number one and i also i also can just tune out listen to the audiobook i was driving you know roughly eight hours a day and it was fine it flew by it was you know someone telling a story it's great really, really fun to listen to an audiobook like that, especially good storytellers like uh, Amy Poehler and David Spade. And uh, Mohammed says, I should check out Polaroid guy in a, in a Snapchat world by Spade. It's epic. So yeah, I think I will check it out also. So re- really funny guy, but the, the common thread, right? So David Spade was doing stand up for like seven years before he was on the tonight show with johnny carson and then he was able to get on the i think young comedian special um i don't know what year but it was like his third attempt to get on the young comedian special on hbo and then that is how he ended up getting an audition for saturday night live and so it was like seven years doing stand-up grinding it out, like doing open mics, traveling across the country, doing stand up, And then he got on Johnny Carson or uh, the tonight show with Johnny Carson. And then he was able to get on the HBO young comedian special. And then he was able to get into SNL. So seven years grinding it out. Amy Poehler, she was, uh, you know, she enjoyed improv since she was a sort of a kid and um, in high school and stuff. And then she, you know, went to college, did improv there. She started uh, like working with the Upright Citizens Brigade in Chicago for years before she got an audition for SNL. So these, I mean, that's hard, hard work in looking at, you know, I know we want success fast, but it takes a long time takes a long time doing this stuff um spencer's been at it for you know many years we just saw a clip from him of course he's been at it for many years and he was doing you know online uh you know niche site sort of marketing stuff for years before he launched niche pursuits and quit his full-time job john dykstra same deal he was doing um some content and some sort of work for i think since like 2004 2005 if i recall correctly and slowly over time started to enjoy it started to make more money um, before he he um you know went full time before he started making as much as he is making now which you can check out his income reports there's a link in the description he's making you know 30 to forty five thousand per month for uh, i think this year and you know he's been slowly growing his empire and further like uh, ron stefanski He's been publishing income reports every single month since the end of 2014, and he started out losing money. He started out losing money, and he's slowly been growing over time. It takes quite a long time to like build up your skills, learn from your fail failures, and just like kind of get your shit together. It takes a long time, and um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I've I. Well, I didn't do research ahead of time, number one. But what I was going to say is like, if you if you are reaching like uh, some big success super early, like I've seen people show up, they launch a blog, maybe they're on a couple podcasts, a few shows, they get a bunch of traffic and then they fizzle out because they didn't stick with it. You never hear anything from them again. Um, you just hear, they come out of nowhere, you, you hear about them. And then they're gone. Like, it's totally possible. You know, I, I almost, I mean, I kind of started that way, right? I, one of my first sites, you know, within the first five or something like that, I made like $6,000 the first retail season in one month. And I was like, this is fantastic. This is amazing. And the site was penalized the next month. And I could have fizzled out. I actually floundered around for about um, 18 months or so before I kind of regrouped 
started to uh, learn from my mistakes and I was like, all right, we can do this. We just got to be patient. So I've been patient. And like I said, there's just been slow growth over time, right? I, I don't think there's a way around it. So that's why I brought up those two audio books. There's like a long grind for whatever industry you're in. There's no overnight, uh, you know, David Spade didn't like audition for SNL and just get right in and start um, you know, writing sketches and he was on TV and then he was starting to make movies with, um, you know, Chris Farley, not like that at all. He was grinding it out for years and years. So anyway, let's see, we have, um, a couple more questions. Okay. So it looks like someone asked, is it possible to put best product under a hundred dollars or something like that? Or does that violate Amazon guidelines? So I cannot answer that for sure. I do not know. I have tried to get an answer in the past, like back in the day when you used to be able to call in and ask an Amazon associate support person. And, um, it was unclear. So I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. I, I mean, I got answers, of yes, and I got answers of no. And it is unclear to me. Here's what I can tell you. In March of 2019, I had my full Amazon Associate account audited. I removed any reference to um, best product under a certain dollar amount. It is unclear if that is allowed or not. The main issue is like if someone... If someone go like Amazon has rules, Um, some people think they're fair, some people think they're unfair, but Amazon has rules to help their customer experience be really good, right? They they want people to like Amazon. They don't want to have any like incongruent pricing, and that is the issue. So the the problem that is trying to be prevented that they are trying to prevent is if someone lands on that page, for example, and let's say. You published it a year ago and there have been some price adjustments. And now one of the products that was $98 is now $104. Well, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit anymore. And that is the risk. So it maybe is like an issue. Maybe it's not. The other layer of complexity is maybe no one, you know, no one's probably going to complain about it. But the problem is if they audit your site and the person that is auditing your site is like, well, they put a price reference in there, then you could have a little bit of an issue. If you make sure everything is definitely well underneath the threshold that you're listing, then it may be okay. So it's up to you, but I could tell you I removed everything because it is, it was very important that I didn't have any violation because any violation can get you kicked out of the program. So for me, (laughs) it's very important. So Richard mentions that you asked too, and they beat around the bush. That is sort of the experience I have. So if you want to be safe and be well within the rules, then you would remove it. Yep. And Dennis says, you got audited too, and you use my guides to make sure you passed. They don't tell you why or what to do. Dennis, I'm so glad that the resource helped you. Um, If, you know, I should probably record a few more episodes on that. But basically, I, I was like, we have, we have rules. Some of those rules are a little bit unclear, but it is pretty clear how to stay well within any of those fuzzy lines. So I stayed well within those fuzzy lines. There's some vague stuff in there. There's some things that are uh, up to interpretation and it's not impossible to just be inside the lines, inside that interpretation so you don't have any issues. All right, so any last questions? I do see Mohit says, what's better, AAWP or Amalinx Pro? Depends on what you need. I can't answer what's better. Um, They're just plugins that help you do things. So ask yourself, as I mentioned before, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, One cool thing, so I'm an affiliate for Amalinx Pro. One cool thing you can do with Amalinx Pro is it will work if you don't have advertising 
access, right? The advertising API access. So they do some smart sort of uh, streamlining of the process to get links from the site stripe. You're able to do a lot of things like pull images, create feature boxes, all those sort of details um, with Amalinks Pro. So I would maybe check that out. Um, as far as like what's best or which is better, I don't know. I don't know. It just depends on what you what you're trying to do. So hey Georgie, what's up, girl? So Georgie is telling me that it is ten past the hour and we're finishing up. So oh, and I see a couple more little questions came through. So Richard says audited how? Um, there's a whole blog post on it. So go check it out on Niche Site Project. Um, basically, they send you an email and they're like, hey, you need to send us this information in five days or your account's going to be shut down. And then you have to send it in. And I guide you through the process. I let you know exactly what I did. Uh, Dennis used the guide and template that, that I have out there. So yeah, I would, I would check it out. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's scary. It's definitely better to um <laughs> it's be- it's definitely better to take care of it before you get audited cuz then you you have more than 5 days when you only have 5 days it's like oh i have to figure out how to do this um snag success says how many total niche sites do i have so i don't answer that but i'll tell you um ah, it, it doesn't even matter who cares how many sites i have um yeah not not a I mean, I just don't share it anymore. So some people talk about stuff. Um, I used to have very few sites. Now I'm getting more. And uh, Chris mentions, like, what's up, Chris? Good to see you on. Um, Chris says you have AWP. You're in the process of, of removing it. Every link that you, every item that you link gives you four Amazon affiliate links and you believe it's overkill. Yeah, I think four is probably more than you need. Um, cool. Dennis, thanks for hopping on. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. If you're in the Atlanta area, be sure to check out the notes in the description for the meetup on Sunday. Please send me an email letting me know that you're going to attend. If you're going to attend, you sh- either you should be able to find my email. All right. You could find it. Trust me. All right. Cool. Everybody have a great day. Catch you later.